everyone, this is update for November 2, 2024, day 983 of the war, end of the date uh, update. First of all, I apologize for belated, um, for belated uh, video. Uh, also catch up for October 29, 30th, 31st and November 1st. So as promised, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about um, uh, Russian BMP-3 and also uh, US made uh, uh, Bradley. Uh, and this is going to be more just from a practical perspective how things are working out on the battlefield, not so much about the theoretical parts, because uh, um, I think practice is real sort of uh, final test of any theory. And if uh, theory doesn't work in practice, then uh, that is a flawed theory and I would say uh, erroneous one. So first, uh, let's look at um, uh, BMP-3. So um, the the reason I brought this um, sort of um, I'd say cut cut off uh, sections is uh, so you understand how it's generally sort of organized and the the key things that I want to uh, want you to focus attention is uh, actually where the engine is in BMP three which is as you can see it's at, uh, at the very end in the back it's sort of more typical. Um, tank like uh, or let's say traditional tank uh, organization where the engine is uh, in the back the reason i'm saying traditional because uh, israeli tanks merkava are uh, actually uh, i would say completely opposite of that so that decision to put uh, engine in the back then drives the rest of the decision of where to put the crew uh, specifically, specifically the the sort of assault team that is it's carrying. So as you can see, those uh, red seats they they sit behind the, the turret and a little bit of, uh, even uh, in front. Uh, and this really creates a huge problem for um, for the crew to exit or the team, the assault team to exit. Uh, BMP-3 uh, once they arrive to the point of uh, where they need to leave and and, and, and directly attack uh, without using actually BMP-3. So uh, this creates a, a lot of problems uh, for uh, the crews. The other uh, key component is that, uh, as you can see, uh, it's use, it has uh, two cannons. One is 100 millimeter cannon and then it's 30 millimeter cannon. And what uh, uh, Russian crews discovered uh, during attacks, so uh, if uh, there is a hit by a shell um, or, or just anything, any, I'd say, uh, any object um, that's designed to destroy, uh, including um, uh, kamikaze drones, uh, if it hits in the area where the, 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 uh, the shell, 100 millimeter shell storage is, uh, the BMP-3 explodes in a typical phenomenal way how uh, all the rest of the Soviet tanks explode where it's essentially it ejects turret and it just complete destruction of the machine uh, and obviously uh, pretty much guaranteed deaths uh, for, um, for most of the crew as you can imagine because uh, if there is explosion it explodes here in our area of turret and then also, it uh, ignites another explosion or uh, strong fire in the engine. So you kind of like caught between uh, <coughs> a rock and a hard place and, and pretty much virtually guaranteed destruction, uh, meaning your purse of the human being. Uh, so for that reason, and this these are 100 millimeter shells. So for this reason, actually, uh, Russian crews that they learned from the battle experience that uh, not to carry, not to bring actually 100 millimeter uh, shells with them. So essentially, this cannon becomes uh, pretty much not useless, but unused. And so effectively, it's almost as if it doesn't exist there. The only uh, really um, useful cannon is this 30 millimeter, um, 30 millimeter cannon. And uh, now I want to actually switch to. Um, so now you understand the, the, the key concepts here and key sort of weaknesses um, uh, in uh, this machine. Uh, the other uh, 
uh, one uh, other important point is that size wise and there probably might be the reason why it was done this way is because um, there was desire to essentially um, uh, make silhouette as small as possible for BNP so that's probably partially what drove um, this decision and but still it's it's pretty poor choice and in, in Russian sort of military and this realizing right now that this was a big mistake but uh, at this point they quite committed and I'll discuss what they're trying to do to sort of address this problem but before that let's just move to uh, uh, Bradley and uh, so I want to sort of compare and contrast and highlight so as you can see the engine is actually in the front uh, but it's actually uh, the way it's done it's on one side so uh it's was a, a right side and on the left side you have drivers so it's actually very similar how uh, israeli tanks are um, designed so basically the same idea is engine on one side and then driver and then you have a pretty big um uh compartment for for the um assault crew and as a and and also uh you know, um, I think it's a 25 millimeter uh, cannon there. Uh, but the, the other important part is um, about the, it's the, as, as you can mention, not about cannon. Um, the other important part is that if you look, the exit is extremely easy. You essentially have this uh, huge, uh, call it gate, whatever you call it, and it. Uh, it goes down and, and essentially entire crew can exit or assault uh, assault team can exit very quickly uh, uh, this uh, machine so what I'm trying to say is that in, on the paper um, it may look and, and that's the, the sort of moral of the story on the paper BMP3 may look sort of more impressive because uh, you have 100 millimeter cannon there um, but actually on battlefield uh, uh, it becomes um, actually a problem a burden that's not used and essentially abandoned by uh, Russian crews uh, at the same time um, Bradley has strong advantage in terms of its how it's organized and where and ease of uh, exit uh, for the assault crews which is uh, very effective um, and also um, the, the fact that uh, um, Bradley doesn't have let's say 100 millimeter shells or any 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 high caliber shells the if some if if it got hit it the survivability of the crew is is very high it's much much higher than BMP3 uh, and so as you can imagine um, that's one of the reasons that uh, Bradley is actually um, something that's uh, very popular in uh, Ukrainian army and I would say in general uh, uh, soldiers uh, like it um, unlike I would say any other Western piece of equipment that um, large, largely turned out to be insufficient for the battlefield um, this uh, in this particular case this this one is actually uh, pretty uh, good solution uh, for uh, the battlefield uh, now let's uh, I mentioned that Russia is trying to solve the problem uh, and so this is our sort of ideas and, and concepts that uh, Russian military is developing and and the idea is uh, you know essentially the same uh, what um, uh, what Bradley is uh, which means that the assault team is going to be in the back you have huge gate that allows quick exit uh, they still cannot uh, I'll say they still uh, clinch to this idea of 100 millimeter um, cannon uh, but then there is also a solution that's that's uh, not using um, you know high explosive shells and then and, and increases servability of the crew so the, the, the problem for us right now is that this is requires significant change in the military industrial complex so it's extremely hard to switch in the middle of the war I mean that is possible um, so but I would say giving 
how Russia Russian system ineffective is in general I, I doubt that this is gonna happen and this is actually uh, inside of this um, uh, sort of new improved it's called this thing Dra Dragoon or something like that uh, BMP 3M, which M probably stands for modernized. Uh, so as you can see now, this is actually uh, pretty much the same as uh, as Bradley. Now let's switch to situation on the battlefield in Ukraine, which is um, becoming more and more disastrous for Ukraine. Uh, I discussed this for many times. Why? It's actually not because um, um, lack of equipment or uh, Russian forces having uh, more troops on the ground that's actually none of that is actually true the root causes are essentially to the and the main one is actually motivation of Ukrainian soldiers went down because actually due to internal pol uh, political situation in the country where um, you see um, Injustice. I would say the one simple explanation that encompasses everything is injustice uh, in the country. And, and some one of the symptoms of that is obviously uh, corruption. But corruption is is really a symptom. It's not truly root cause uh, of anything. And um, but um, I would say extremely. Uh, going back to this injustice, that's really driven by uh, extremely incompetent. Uh, political top uh, in Ukraine and, and generally military top as well because it's being appointed by the incompetent political top so they select uh, likewise uh, individuals uh, and, and that all obviously uh, translates all the way from the top to the bottom but as I stated before it's all fish always rots from the top uh, and, and the problem in Ukraine is in the top uh, not uh, not because um, not in the ordinary people who decided that they, they don't want to uh, uh, fight for something that where they don't have personal stakes and, and that's really um, uh, the, the the sort of answer to that uh, uh, and then now let's uh, start I'm gonna do a walk through in a clockwise fashion starting from very north so first situation in the Kursk region of Russia uh, which is turning to uh, probably um, political disaster slowly but surely for um, Ukrainian president uh, and his group uh, where uh, Ukrainian forces are slowly but surely being squeezed out. The fighting is still going on around this uh, bottleneck, around this Novo Ivanivka. Um, I would say the, the, the the, the message from the Russian president that the Ukrainian troops were 2,000 Ukrainian troops were um, captured, uh, sorry, uh, encircled there. Uh, I think becoming even more, you know, becoming more. I, I think that it's becoming more obvious that that is uh, false information. As you can see, you don't see any uh, at this point. It probably was what 10, 15 days. You don't see any uh, captured Ukrainian soldiers, let's say 2,000 or anything like that. So, uh, the, uh, but the, despite that, the, the truth is that uh, Ukrainian forces are on defensive and slowly but surely losing ground uh, in Kursk region. And unfortunately, there's very little um, uh, objective information or verifiable information, so it's it's very hard to show exact um, uh, front line there. Uh, also, uh, yeah, with respect to North Korean troops, um, while I would anything is possible, there is still no clear evidence that uh, North Korean troops are on the front front line attacking or fighting with Ukrainian troops. So that uh, yet to be sort of proven as as a factual um, uh, evidence, uh, so far um, uh, there there is no evidence for that. Uh, now let's move to situation north northeast of Kharkiv. Uh, actually, uh, Russian troops uh, or Russian command uh, got a little bit more active. There are some uh, small scale attacks um, uh, around the Chansky area. 
uh, without major sort of changes. Uh, it's without uh, you know, gaining um, any um, Ukrainian territory there. Uh, now let's move to the North Luhansk section of the front line. Uh, things here also more or less the same. Strong Russian pressure uh, south of Kupiansk and the same is north of Kupiansk. The Russian troops are gain, gaining gained a little bit of ground uh, north northeast of Kupiansk. Um, uh, otherwise, the situation remains more or less the same. Um, uh, strong Russian pressure in uh, Terny, which probably going to be lost pretty soon, and uh, also in this uh, Serebransky forest in the southern area. But so far, uh, there Ukrainian forces are holding on. Uh, now let's move to uh, North Donbass section of the front line. Um, so the, the northern part is relatively quiet, uh, just not much going on there. Uh, the southern, the Russian pressure continues around Chesivyar, north and south, the typical pincer, textbook pincer strategy that Russian uh, command is uh, employing. But um, uh, sort of the problem for Russian side is that uh, they um, don't have enough uh, forces or resources there because some of them were actually taken to Kursk region. So... I think 106 uh, airborne division was taken there. Uh, probably some other um, some other units as well. And so then, um, so then Russian troops don't have enough sort of punch power um, to get through Ukrainian defenses. And so so far, line more or less holding on there. Uh, now uh, let's move uh, south, where mm, to central actually Donbas uh, front line, where things are. I would say on the verge of pretty large catastrophe uh, for um, Ukrainian forces. So what's going on is that Russian uh, command is essentially uh, stopped most of its activity, I would say, north of Selidove, uh, and it's solely focusing on this um, um, south, southeastern or southern sector between Velika Novosilka and essentially Selidove. That's uh, the key focus area and and more specifically more narrow is um, the Russian attack from the south from the area Shom uh, Shakhtarsky and then Novo Ukrainka Maximilianuka this this area and then also attack from the north direction of Sonsivka was as you can imagine it's very straightforward to to see uh, the point is. To, to use the spincers from the uh, south and north and essentially collapse all of the Ukrainian defenses here around Kurakhova and uh, capture Kurakhova without major fight because otherwise Kurakhova will, uh, will be extremely expensive for Russian troops to, um, to capture. So uh, Russian command is obviously doing intelligent things. They're trying to... Um, uh, to create uh, encirclement, a threat of encirclement, and, and squeeze Ukrainian troops out, which the typical strategy so far that worked, and, and, and I'm sure that Russian command will continue employing it. Uh, the problem is, the biggest problem is actually in the southern part, not so much on the northern, but northern is still pretty bad. Uh, the south is uh, essentially um, Russian troops continuing pretty quick advance, I would say, uh, towards uh, this intersection that I showed you here near this village, Lakli, and I think there's some other village there. But uh, the point is that uh, so far Ukrainian forces were not able to stop advance of Russian troops, uh, even though Ukraine command brought in 128th Brigade, but uh, it's um, it, it was not able to stop. Uh, and uh, one of the let's say, be, besides that reason that they stated about motivation uh, and uh, general feeling uh, in Ukrainian army, uh, there is sort of specific, more tactical reason is uh, there is no real defensive positions there prepared. And so uh, essentially, um, Ukrainian forces don't have uh, good defensive positions. It's really just fields and uh, very shallow uh, trenches that don't provide adequate um, 
defensive capabilities, let's put it this way. So uh, as a result, Ukrainian uh, uh, troops basically falling back. Uh, in the way it goes, it's not far from the moment when uh, Kurahwe uh, will need to be evacuated by Ukrainian forces, um, as you can imagine. Uh, that probably will uh, create even more internal tensions in Ukraine, uh, political tensions, and, 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 and so on. Uh, so this is a little bit more updated map uh, on the situation around uh, Kurahove. Uh, so as you can see, Russian troops managed to uh, quite quickly advance from, uh, let's say, Novokrainka to Maksimivka. They captured Maksimivka. Uh, and so this, uh, this is becoming quite dangerous for uh, Ukrainian uh, forces and, and the, the intersection I was mentioning this uh, between Andreevka and Constantinople and essentially even coming somewhere closer to this line of Razlev Zelenivka is already essentially paralyzing all of the defenses here and it's like guaranteed uh, for that Russian troops will capture Kurahova uh, because the supply lines will be uh, severely constrained so they not you know they they still gonna work but it's it's not you know you, you basically not uh, it's it's essential like uh you know your organ is not receiving enough uh, blood eventually it dies it's just a slow death um but it's gonna happen and and again this doesn't mean that that russian troops somehow miracle is gonna happen and they're gonna get stopped at this line of uh, Razlev Zelenivka. I think that, that, that this is a very unlikely scenario. Uh, now let's, and this is where the situation was just, what, five days ago, as you can see, quite significant advance, especially from this, from Novokrainka to Maksimivka, uh, and also past uh, Yasna Poliana. And again, uh, the key point that even bringing fresh, um, Fresh, uh, fresh brigade did not stop uh, Russian uh, advance, even though 128th brigade is considered pretty on uh, on a on a good uh, good side or better quality, more motivated uh, unit. Uh, now let's look at the situation on the north, uh, uh, sorry, on the Parisian front line, uh, and things here are more or less quiet. Some local pressure, but really nothing meaningful. Uh, again, the, the the simplest explanation is uh, all of the Russians' resources are thrown into this battle around um, Kurahova uh, or Central and Bas front line and also to Kursk, a region of Russia. Uh, and let's finish with the situation along the Dnipro River and things here are completely quiet. Nothing is going on here. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. And until next time, bye-bye.